laughing at me. I make it out, but I'll never get back. I don't know. What have you got there? Well, it's alive without breath and cold as death. Never thirsty, but always drinking. Wearing armor, but never clinking. What is it? I didn't know there was going to be a test. Well, let me give you another big hint. The name of today's program is How Do You Grow a Fish Sandwich? I've got it. It's a fish. Right, get the net, Nick, because I'm dragging one Whoa. in. Oh, we're going to be talking about fish, like we've got right here. Well, it's not actually like we have right here, because okay. we're going to talk about real fish, like the kind that make fish sandwiches. Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Carla. And I'm Nick, and this is Reginald. And today on Gee Whiz and Agriculture, we're going to learn more about agriculture in ways that are going to surprise you. I'm surprised already. Because even if you do catch fish on a farm and grow lettuce on a farm, you don't grow a fish sandwich on a farm. Well... Are you saying you grow a fish sandwich on a sandwich farm? No, no, no. We grow fish on fish farms. <laughs> and actually, fish farming involves two different sciences. The first one being horticulture. I know what that is. That's growing fruits, vegetables, and flowers. Right. And the other one is aquaculture. Wow. Good work. Aqua means water, so that must mean growing things in water. Very, very good. That's exactly what it is. And aquaculture does mean farming in water, literally. That's the translation on the word. And today we're going to find out more about horticulture and aquaculture. And we're going to learn all kinds of things. I'll let you put Reginald over here on the okay. back wall. There you go, Reggie. <laughs> and to give you really a better idea of how important horticulture is to things, Horticulture is a $2 billion industry when you just think in terms of plants and shrubs people plant around their home. And that's not counting all these different vegetables and things mm. that we see in our groceries and things. So you think about it, horticulture involves things like the potatoes <laughs> that we make potato chips with. Nick, here, Don't mind one. if I do. And also the tomatoes that go in things like ketchup and the mushrooms you put on pizza and all those kinds of things and the lettuce that we're going to use in our fish sandwich. Mm -hmm. Now we better get to the fish part too, because to have a right. fish sandwich, we need the fish as mm -hmm. well. And a lot of people think that might just come from the grocery store or just right. from the ocean. But mm. actually, there are fish farms <laughs> that produce a lot of the fish that we eat okay. and buy at the grocery. And aquaculture basically tells us how to grow these fish properly. And mm. the study of aquaculture involves all kinds of scientists. Like, you need to know about chemistry, uh, nutrition, uh, horticulture, biology, and some other things, too. Gee whiz, Dr. C. Every week you come up with another surprise. Tree farms, horse farms, now fish farms. I just know that somebody has some questions. Gee whiz, yeah! in a brook, catch them with a little hook. Uh, what next? Is a fish farm like a horse farm? What kind of fence do you use on a fish farm? Fence? What kind of fish do you go on a fish farm? Sharks. Shark farm? I don't think so. Have people been farming for fish for a long time like cows? What's the difference between an ocean fish and a fish farm fish? Little fishy in a, little fishy in a brook, catch them with a little, little hook. Uh, mm. Then, oh. How does the greenhouse work? How do you grow lettuce in a greenhouse? How do you grow plants in water? Can you grow lettuce in water? What do you feed fish on a fish farm? You feed them fish food. Like goldfish? How do you grow plants without dirt? Do fish in the grocery come from fish farms? What about fish in restaurants? If lettuce comes from lettuce farms, and fish come from fish farm. How do you go fish sandwich? Gee whiz, that's the question of the day. And to get some answers of the day, it's time to go talk to some experts. 
And since we're talking about fish and aquaculture, good word. Something tells me Mary Alice may get a little damp today. Mary Alice? Good guess, Nick. If you want to learn about aquaculture, you are going to eventually have to get wet, and you're going to have to talk, talk to some aquaculturists like Dr. James Tidwell. Dr. Tidwell is with Kentucky State University in Frankfort, Kentucky, and he knows all about aquaculture. The reason why we're here by the water is to see what a fish farm looks like and how it works. But why would you want to have a fish farm when you can just go catch fish in the ocean? Well, the reason we want to have a fish farm is that Americans are eating more and more fish. The problem is that we're catching less fish every year from the oceans. So if we're eating more fish but catching less fish, it's got to come from somewhere. And more and more these days, it's coming from aquaculture. What's aquaculture? Well, aquaculture, the technical term is to the controlled husbandry of aquatic plants and animals. But in its simplest terms, it's fish farming. Oh. We learned that different breeds of horses and cattle are raised for different reasons. Is that the same as fish farming? In a way, uh, we raise different types of fish, but fish are cold-blooded. So we raise different types of fish, mostly uh, because we're in different parts of the country and have different temperatures. Uh, in the deep south, we raise mostly catfish, whereas you go further north, uh, they raise mostly trout, which are more cold water type of fish. A lot of our research here is to develop new kinds of fish uh, that really like the cooler temperatures, the kind of in-between temperatures that we have here. What do you feed fish on a fish farm? Well, on a fish farm, we feed them fish feed. And the fish feed is made of mostly corn and soybeans. So really, we feed them plants. And the feed after the fish eat it, they excrete ammonia and nitrite. And, and those are different forms of nitrogen. And the plants that grow in the pond eat the nitrogen. So that actually cleans up the water for the fish. So we feed the fish plants, but the fish feed plants. So there's a cycle to it here that keeps the, the water clean for the fish, but also uh, feeds the plants and keeps the water clean for the plants. And the plants as they grow, they also produce oxygen that the fish need. Okay, Mary Alice, since we're on a fish farm, it's fairly obvious that fish are different from other farm animals in some ways, since they have to live in water. But they're not that different when you really get to know them. Uh, what are the, some of the things that, that fish need that's the same as other farm animals need? Well, they have to have somewhere to live. They have to breathe oxygen and eat. That's right. And they really need clean water. And other farm animals do too. So really, al although there's some differences as, as far as raising fish and water, uh, there's more similarities to other farm animals than there are differences in many ways. I know that fish don't breathe water. They breathe oxygen. But how does the oxygen get down into the water? Uh, you're right, the, the fish do need oxygen and uh, they get it from the water and that's one way they're different from other farm animals. And that's why they have gills instead of lungs is, is that allows them to get dissolved oxygen, we call it, out of the water. Uh, in a pond situation like this, most people think that the oxygen gets in the water from just diffusing down from the, the air or the atmosphere. And that's not really so. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of the oxygen in a pond actually comes from photosynthesis. And that just means that there's microscopic plants that are growing in the pond and when the sun shines on them like, like all plants, they produce oxygen. So really in a pond, most of the oxygen comes from sunlight and photosynthesis rather than from diffusion like most people think. So we have fish that eat food which they produce waste and then the plants take in the wastes and then they breathe out or they release oxygen mm -hmm. and then the fish breathe in the oxygen mm -hmm. and then then they breathe out CO2 which the plants breathe in but we still but nobody's eating the fish sandwich well to complete our fish sandwich let's go inside and see if we can't learn something about hydroponics Hydroponics, good word. Looks like it's traveling time. Hi, every time we travel like this, we meet another expert in agriculture or aquaculture, or today, hydroponics. Gee whiz, that's a good word. Now we're going to talk to Sharon Bale.
What do plants need to grow? Well, they need lots of things. One of the things that they need is air, but it isn't just all the air. They really need the carbon dioxide or the CO2 out of the air. That's what they use to help manufacture food. And then another thing they need is the right temperature. You know, like this nice little begonia, if you put it outside in the winter, it wouldn't be able to tolerate it. It would die, so they have to have proper temperatures for proper growth. And another thing they need is water. You know, if you let your plants dry out at home, they don't like it too much, and they desiccate, and really what they do is just flat die. So that's definitely one thing that they need. And another thing they need are nutrients. They have to be fed. And some of the things that plants like to eat are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then some of the, what they call trace elements that they don't need so much of, things like calcium or zinc. How would you like to have a meal of zinc one night? I wouldn't like that. Well, the plants do. They like lots of things like that. But it is very, very necessary that you supply the proper amount of nutrients for the plant. And of course, obviously what they need is sunlight. It's bright in here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And we have to have lots of light for plants to grow well. If you put them in a really dark situation, they just simply won't take off and grow. And there's lots of ways to grow plants. And the people that work on growing plants or the science and study of growing plants are people called horticulturists. And did you know that a horticulturist is in your life every day? Mm -mm. Well, did you have an apple in the last week? Yeah. Well, it was a horticulturist that tried to work on developing the varieties and the breeds of, of apples that will hold up well and so that you can eat those. And then these pretty flowers, there's horticulturists that work on those. So horticulture is something that's very, very close to us each and every day of our life. But back to growing plants. Here we have some plants that are growing in soil. Well, this really isn't soil. It just looks like soil. This is what we call a growing medium. And all that it's there for is to provide support for the plant's roots. If we didn't have it, the plants would fall over. Mm -hmm. But if that's what it's for is to, to fertilize, and the way we get the nutrients in here is we just run a system and we fertilize these plants on a regular basis. And to supply the water that they need, we use a hose and we hose them down on a regular basis and when it dries out you know we make sure that it gets plenty of water and if the light intensity goes down we'll turn some special lights on so we can control those types of things but we don't necessarily need this soil to grow plants and the method of growing plants without soil is called hydroponics what's hydroponics well it's a simple system that involves the culture of growing plants using water. And I have some assistants over here that would be happy to show you a hydroponic system and explain it to you. Hi, Cassidy. Hi. Hi, Ben. Hi. Can you show us how plants live without soil? Well, this is a hydroponic system. And in this certain hydroponic system, there is a pump and a timer. And when the plants need water, the timer will go off and the pump will pump water through the tube and up to the beginning of the hydroponic system. Once the water enters the trough, it flows down, hitting every single one of the roots of the plants or vegetables or whatever might be in the hydroponic system giving it the nutrients that it needs and the water that it needs to survive and grow. Hey, look, Mary Alice. No soil, but a bunch of roots. Look, Mary Alice, a bunch of roots, but no soil. This is just another kind of hydroponic system. The plants are floating in the water. This may look like soil, but it really isn't. It's just there to help them support. This is the food that the plants use for, the, um, for their food, to give it its nutrients. Okay, that's how hydroponics works. But why would you want to grow lettuce on water instead of soil? Well, the hydroponic system that you saw was just a small replica of what a big system could be. 
Now, I doubt that you'd want to try to grow lettuce like this at home, but you could. You could grow it hydroponically. But what this system is used for is commercial production. And that means big greenhouses full of hydroponic plants. And that could be lettuce, tomatoes. There's lots of different things. Have you ever looked in the grocery store and seen the little sticker on the tomatoes that says hydroponic? Well, it's a method of producing the plants. Now, all of this stuff can be grown out in the field, but when you get off season or when it's cold and you come into the greenhouse, you can produce plants when they normally wouldn't be available. And now we're starting to get to talk economics and how much can you produce a square foot so that the grower makes some money. So when we talked about what it takes to, let, to get a plant to grow well, but when you come into the greenhouse, the whole thing you're dealing with is control. We can control the temperature in this greenhouse. Mm -hmm. We can control the amount of sunlight. We can control the amount of CO2. Some greenhouses are run by computers and they have sensors out there. And when it says this CO2 level in the air has dropped a little bit low, it will shoot some CO2 into the greenhouse. So see, it's trying to get these things not just to grow, but to be at their optimum growth. So one of the things that we control in this hydroponic system are the nutrients. So as this plant grows and needs more nutrients, the water will be tested in a lab and it'll say, oh, we need a little bit more nitrogen. We need a little bit less phosphorus. And maybe this lettuce would like a little taste of calcium. So it's all a very, very complicated process, even though it looks really simple. So aquaculture is where we get farm-raised fish, and hydro hydroponics is where we get lettuce with no dirt. So just one more question. How do you grow a fish sandwich? Well, I have a plate and a bun. And why don't you go meet Dr. Tidwell? I think he just about has that sandwich ready for you. Okay, are you ready for your fish sandwich, Mary Alice? That's not a fish sandwich. No, that's not a fish sandwich. But we do have the fish, and we do have the lettuce. Remember, we talked a little bit about aquaculture and the ways of, of raising fish, and we talked about horticulture, which is the way that we use to raise the lettuce. When we talked about aquaculture, what is it that we learned about the fish down here? Well, the fish produce waste, which has nitrogen in it, and then the lettuce, or the plants, suck the nitrogen in through the roots. That's right, and, and out in natural bodies of water, we have plants there, too, that take the nitrogen out of the water and clean it up. Uh, also, what is it that the fish need to breathe? Oxygen. Okay, they breathe oxygen in, but after they use it, what do they breathe back out? Carbon dioxide. So we've got fish that are producing it and don't want it, and it's building up in the system. And either the plants need it, so they take it back out. So after they use CO2, what do the plants give off? Oxygen. And what did we learn in the aquaculture part that the fish need to breathe? Oxygen. Oxygen's in there every time. Right. So the plants are taking out the CO2, and they're cleaning up the water for the fish, but they're also producing oxygen that the fish need. Okay, so they're improving it in two ways. They're taking out what they don't need and they're putting in what the fish do need. And the plants are also benefiting from it. And that's something that goes on naturally in the natural environment. Okay, those are really important and we've got these arrows over here to illustrate these cycles and how they work. So Mary Alice, why don't we use these to show what's going on? The fish produce waste which has nitrogen in it and the plants suck up the nitrogen. Then the fish breathe out carbon dioxide, which the plants breathe in. Then the, then the plants release oxygen, which the fish breathe in. Right, so both these conditions help the fish keep their environment in good shape, helps the lettuce keep their environment in better shape. It looks like a cycle that would go on forever. It is a cycle, but it's a cycle in miniature or a model of a cycle. The same processes that go on here between the lettuce and the fish go on in nature. They go on within a pond, between a pasture and a pond. They go on uh, in the ocean, between the, the beach and, and the continents and the ocean. They go on on the scale of the whole earth. 
and all the components must work together for the good of the others. For example, in our tank here, if the temperature changes just a little bit, that's going to affect how the lettuce lives. If, if the lettuce is affected, that's going to affect the fish. So that's an example of why we must be able to control pollution. Uh, things like global warming, all those things interact. We must be able to carefully manage the plants and the animals and the water. They must all work together and work together to keep each other alive and to keep us alive. Who would have thought such a simple thing as a fish sandwich could be so complicated? I guess that's why they call it Gee Whiz in Agriculture. Gee Whiz is right. I didn't know about all those systems and cycles and balances and how just growing a fish sandwich is pretty awesome. Well, actually, the whole idea of ecology is pretty awesome. And I think it's easy to understand how to control those things in a tank like we just have seen. But when you think about the fish and lettuce model, that's a natural system that we've learned to control from nature into a controlled type of environment. And that's just a small cycle that we've learned about. Think about even bigger ones. There's all kinds of things that are more complicated and even more delicate. Think of the entire planet and the ecosystem mm. of it and what things keep it in balance. I think we need to look at this. The lettuce fish experiment that we just looked at is a model of an ecologically closed system. In such a system, chemicals and compounds cycle within the system with little or no input from outside the system. The fish lettuce model illustrates the cycling of oxygen, which is produced by the plants and used by the fish, and CO2, which is produced by the fish and used by the plants. Also, we saw how nitrogen, in the form of ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate, is produced by the fish and then used by the plants. We also saw how the nitrogen in the plants forms protein, which can be used as food by the fish. As a model, this system is a small, simple illustration of what actually occurs in nature. In nature, these very same processes occur, but on a larger scale, and through a much more complex series of interrelationships. The study of these interrelationships is known as ecology. In nature, these cycles don't occur just between plants and fish, and they don't occur just in water. In nature, these chemical cycles also involve land animals and plants, as well as the soil and the air. In fact, many of the nutrients found in ponds, lakes, and streams originated on dry land and fell into water as leaves or washed in with the rain. Also, of the ammonia and CO2 given off by the fish, plants take up much of it, but some is lost directly to the atmosphere. So, in nature, these cycles are on a much larger scale than they are in our model and involve many subsystems within the system. These cycles operate on a scale even larger than occurs between ponds, trees, fish, and animals of the forest. These same cycles also operate between the oceans and the continents. In fact, most of the oxygen that we breathe was produced by microscopic plants in the ocean, and that's probably a long way from where you live. And did you know that most of the carbon dioxide that you breathe out winds up back in the ocean or in a rainforest in South America? In fact, that is one of the main concerns with cutting of the rainforest. Without the forest to take up the carbon dioxide, it may accumulate in the atmosphere, contributing to the greenhouse effect and global warming. So we hope our simple model has made it easier to understand the concepts of cycling, subsystems, closed systems, and the interrelationships of subunits within the closed system. Also, as we come to understand the model, we come to understand that it is a small representation of processes that occur on a larger scale in a much more complex way. Maybe our simple model can help us to understand that the Earth itself is really a closed ecological system and that all its subsystems are interconnected. As we begin to understand these concepts, we begin to understand that many of these cycles operate on a global scale with no concept of countries and their boundaries. With this in mind, we can begin to understand how the cutting of a tree in a faraway rainforest can affect the size of the polar ice cap in the Arctic and the weather in our own state. Also, once we understand these cycles and interrelationships, 
we can learn to work with them rather than disrupting them. This is the concept used in the lettuce fish system, which raises two crops and creates a better environment for both. This approach is being used by many people in agriculture who understand that what is waste in some places may well be a resource when used properly in another situation. With all the work being done in ecology, and horticulture, and agriculture, and aquaculture, and hydroponics, good word. There must be lots of exciting jobs you could do in science and agriculture. Oh, there's all kinds of things in aquaculture. Do you know that aquaculture is one of the fastest growing segments of the agricultural industry in the United States? So, so that means there's a lot of people that need to be trained in these areas and there actually aren't enough people to hire to fill all of these jobs. And as land becomes more and more scarce, really we need more and more fish farms because that's one area where we're going to be growing food. And if you think about it, that's why you need to be studying biology and chemistry and all those other fun science subjects at school now, because you might end up with a job in aquaculture before it's all over. And just think, it's going to just go right out of this world, too, because what do you think the astronauts eat while they're up in space? They don't have any soil up there. So I bet hydroponics is going to start coming into play here as well, growing food up in space where they're out there on space missions for years and years and all that type of thing. So. We might even be growing a fish sandwich in outer space. Wow, when we got here today, it was just you sitting around in a life jacket reeling in a cloth, cloth fish. We didn't know how to grow a fish sandwich, and now we're doing it in outer space. Gee whiz. And gee whiz, we're about out of time, so it's time to say all of our thank yous. Like to Dr. Jim Tidwell at Kentucky State for telling us about aquaculture. And let's thank also Sharon Bale for telling us about hydroponics. I love that word. And Ben and Cassidy for showing us how those two systems really work together. And everybody at Kentucky State University for letting us see how you grow a fish sandwich. And by the way, if you'd like to try hydroponics at home like Ben and Cassidy, you can order kits from your 4-H club or from the National Junior Horticulture Association. Then you can grow your very own fish sandwich. And do your own television show. But you're going to have to get another name because there's only one. G. Wiz in Agriculture. agriculture.